You are listening to the Leaving Inside Out podcast, and I'm your host, Tops Arutare. This is episode two. Thank you for tuning into the Leaving Inside Out podcast, where we make mindset changes using tools from everyday life and business experiences. I believe we were created with the resource needed to live the life we truly want. But this can only happen after we've removed limiting beliefs which hold us back. Episode 2 is The Rockstar Story. If this is your first time listening, welcome. I am so happy to have you. If you are listening for the second time, thank you for coming back. Today, we'll be going deeper into the eye of the storm in my story. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then you need to go back to episode one where I gave an overview of my entrepreneurial journey. You'll meet words like recession and tears and purpose and mindset and more. Do you remember Hurricane Harvey that devastated parts of Texas and Louisiana? I think it was almost three years ago now. Time flies. I remember watching the live broadcast with my mouth wide open because there in the midst of the wind and the storm was a human reporting the news. The camera then switched over to a satellite view and he pointed out a spot and said to us that that was a flock of birds that were flying, not away from the storm, but into the storm. The eye of the storm is the center of a storm or hurricane and known to be the safest place to be. So I read up on eagles, which have a different way for dealing with storms. They don't fly into the eye of the storm. Instead, they fly towards it and then they use its wind and its force to rise higher until the storm is safely below them. I think that's just incredible. What these birds do is going against logic, and sometimes that's the only way to go. The loss of my business, as you can imagine, brought with it shame and embarrassment, and I was unwilling to talk about it. Whenever I attended networking events, I would stutter and pivot when asked how I got into the luxury baby furniture market. It just was not something I was willing to talk about comfortably. I mean, think about it. I had a DIY website. I sold beautiful products, yet I was broke. I wanted my old life back and I just didn't want to accept that things had changed for good. And, you know, for years, my only prayer was, Lord, please just take us back to where we used to be. In addition to all of this, I suffered from imposter syndrome. That's a whole episode by itself. Because somehow I got myself into believing that although I worked hard, although people even loved my business and my products and and I got all of this, you know, celebration from people, <laughs> I didn't think that I deserved any recognition because I did things on a budget. So I kept comparing my reality to the one that I preferred, which was obviously in my past and hopefully in the future. Living in the moment was not something I was interested in at all. Remember that I was also nursing my newborn baby and I felt guilty that he would miss out on the life that I wanted for him. Because when you're in a hopeless state, a wall somehow manages to erect itself in front of you and it reaches so high that you can't see your future And everything around you becomes your present and your future. And that's what happened to me. My boys were happy. They had all they need. Yes, they missed their old life too, but they were generally happy. Yet I felt so guilty. And mom guilt is a real thing. I did, however, carry on building my business, at least the best way that I could, with zero capital. I came to believe that there are many currencies besides cash. Sweat is one of them. For example, after building the website, which was a mammoth feat, and again, that is a whole episode by itself, I learned that it needed to be optimized so that it it was found easily on Google. 
And this was at a one of my many networking events that I had attended. I met a gentleman by the name of Mike Bradley, and Mike explained that I needed search engine optimization, also known as SEO for short. And he offered his services for a discounted £1,000 amount per month or something like that. Now, you have to understand that this was 12 years ago, and I was going through a major storm at the time as well. When you stack up £1,000 against the backdrop of nothing, it's a million pounds. So yes, let's just conclude that this guy wanted me to pay a million pounds a month for SEO. That's what it felt like. So we reached an agreement. He would teach me how to do it myself for £100 per hour. And I'll see if I can manage to have one hour a week or one hour every other week in lessons done. In week one, I understood why he charged what he did. It was manual labor. It was intensive and frustrating, especially as we didn't expect to see results for the first three to six months. This was not a lesson in SEO. Mm -mm. (laughs) This was a lesson in being patient while broke. One day, I came across a write-up in a business magazine which changed the trajectory of my life. The article introduced two women, one after the other. The first introduction went like this. Meet Kate. After graduating from Oxford, Kate landed a job at a top law firm in one day. She had only been working there for a year when she left to get into the exciting world of publishing. Not satisfied with the publishing world, she often moved to Brussels where she launched her own talent agency. Her new book will be released next spring. That's a nice one, right? Now listen to the second introduction. Meet Kate. Despite attending one of the top universities in the country, she only managed to graduate with a third class. On graduation day, she ran into her father's friend who gave her a role in his firm as a clerk, where she walked for a year. Kate was miserable, considering her almost degree, and to make it worse, she was made redundant during a shake-up. With the help of a friend, she was able to get another job, this time as a receptionist in a publishing firm. Her life was a far cry from the successful one she envisaged and still managed to lose that job less than a year later. Completely broke, she headed to Brussels, lived with her aunt and is now trying her hand at running a business and she hopes to write a book one day. Both people, I'm sure you figured out, are the same. The first story is the rock star version and the second is the sob story. Which one do you prefer? The article ended with an invitation to the reader to write their own rock star story. Listen, I did not have to be told twice. I grabbed a pen and paper and rewrote my story in its rock star version. And when I read it over, (laughs) I was walking on air. I liked the story. I even liked the woman that was in the story and whoever she was, I was more than happy to become her. Your rock star story highlights your achievements and it normalizes your failures. Because failure is normal. (laughs) but we often feel embarrassed at sharing it. And the Rockstar story empowers you to own the narrative of your life and what you own has zero control over you. For example, I was reluctant to talk about my experience of losing everything because it made me feel small and inadequate. The minute I decided on the narrative, all negative emotion associated with my experience earned bragging rights. Personally, and I don't know about you, but I don't know of any highly successful self-made entrepreneur that has not experienced some type of failure. So if you failed, you're in good company. Failure is not who you are. Failure is just an experience. But the thing with these kinds of experiences is that they have a way of layering your insides so that your thoughts and your emotions stem from them. And that's exactly what happened to me. My thoughts and identity seemed to come from 
my challenges because that was what was uppermost in my mind. Living inside out separates your experiences from your identity. You, you could even say that living inside out reestablishes who is master and who is servant. And your rock star story helps you to master your experiences. After writing my story, I referred to it whenever I felt down in the dumps. And without meaning to, I memorized it. One day, I attended an event and I saw an advert for a charity afternoon tea. I love afternoon teas, but I had also just done a vision board. And one of my goals, which I had placed on the board, was to support a charity. So I took the ad and I um, tried to reach out to the organizers who appear to have forgotten to put their contact details on, but I found them on Twitter and they responded to my tweet with the information I had requested concerning the charity. It also happened that the organizer was a journalist for a national newspaper. And so when she went to my Twitter profile, she clicked through to the website fell in love with the products, contacted me again and said, we would love to feature your products in the paper. So we made an arrangement and she came to meet me. We had coffee together. I'm telling her about, uh, you know, the products I sell and just giving her some more information so she could feature just one or two items, perhaps a bed or, you know, maybe a dresser or whatever it was or some decorative item. And as she picked up her coat to leave, she asked rather casually, so how did you even get into this business, Tux? And I had no answer for her except what tumbled out of my mouth. I did not mean to, but it was my rock star story. That just came flying out of my mouth. And she sat back down, picked up her phone, called the editor and said, we have a story and we must run it because it's a good one. And they went on to do a feature on yours truly and also went on to feature the business separately um, in uh, a couple more editions over the next few months. Who would have thought that a story that I was too ashamed to share will one day land in the papers and lead to my being shortlisted for multiple business awards, invitations to join charity organizations, and even an invitation to a reception with the British Prime Minister at his residence in Downing Street. And about that reception at Downing Street, <laughs> I ignored the first invite because I thought it was spam until his office called me requesting me to RSVP. So I did twice. <laughs> and then I worried that I'll spill drinks on his carpet because I do stuff like that too. The reception was attended by some of the big wigs in entrepreneurship and the entertainment world. Suffice it to say, the way you present yourself determines how others receive you. And the way you see yourself determines how you present yourself. Writing your own story gives you the tools to show up in a powerful, confident manner that will lead you to live the life you truly want. Owning your narrative is the process where you use the forceful winds of the storm, just like the eagle, and let it lift you up until you're above it and you can glide effortlessly. Your rock star story, writing it, knowing it, memorizing it, is not running away from the storm. It's not being afraid of it. It's standing in front of it and allowing its winds and crashing waves to lift you up. Now, what if rising above the challenge is not an option? Answer, you've got to go through it. Here's how. One dominant emotion during a storm is fear. Fear can be so powerful that it overwhelms all other emotions and that's all you can identify, that's all you can feel. From my experience, fear becomes the filter through which you view life. When we live inside out, we draw our inspiration from a part of us that is deeper than logic, or should I say more meaningful even than logic and deeper than emotions. 
when we live superficially, emotions like fear and doubt and, you know, all of that negative emotions and even positive emotions as well, along with mindsets like self-doubt and insecurities, they make the decisions for us. And one thing you've got to know about emotions of all types, whether they're happy, sad, is that they're unreliable. I've had a running battle with fear over the years and I've tried different techniques for dealing with it. I've tried ignoring it, tried to bury my head in the sand, tried to distract myself by pretending that the storm isn't there. Everything. I, you know, will do all I need to do except address the storm and none of that stuff works. But one thing I've come to understand is you've got to acknowledge that there is a storm and you are in the storm. Closing your eyes and hoping it disappears will not work because I've tried that and it definitely didn't work. I'm sure you have as well. What you need to do is change the filter through which you're viewing life. So whether it's a filter of fear, whether it's a filter of insecurity or even just bad memories, because I know that even when the storm came to an end for a very, very, very long time, every time something remotely close to problems in the business happened, I would almost have palpitations because they would take me right back to that fearsome, stormy period of my life. So I had to learn to peel that layer off my mind because it had become the mindset through which my thoughts grew from. So the first thing is you, it's important that you acknowledge that you are in a storm. Next, you want to make sure that you're in a space of peace. I can't make a healthy decision when my mind is battling fear or confusion or even anger. You need quietness, you need peace of mind during that time in a storm. And One practical way that I do it is, first of all, I pray and leave it in the hands of God. And the second thing I do is get my journal out and I draw a line down a blank page, top to bottom, list the first one on the left is facts and the second one on the right is assumptions. For example, I have just received an email from work and I've been told I'm going to get laid off that's a fact. Versus, I have just been told I will not be coming, I shouldn't be come back to work next week and I'm going to lose my job and I'm going to lose my home and I'm going to be homeless by the end of next month. That's an assumption. The reason why you want to separate fact from assumption is when we are stressed and we're worried, the brain has a hard time deciphering between the two. And you begin to act on something that you've only assumed and is not actually true. So when you have your list of facts and assumptions, you know that you can only act on the fact and you can cross the assumptions out. What I do is go through the assumptions and see if there's any element of truth in any of them. And a lot of times you'll find that there is no basis for (laughs) your assumption. It's just an extrapolation of your own imagination and you've just created a scenario from a suggestion. That's what really does happen when we start to assume. You can only build on fact. You can't build on assumptions. The other mindset to adopt is one of detachment. In the Bahamas, when a builder builds a house, a commercial building, besides the normal building regulation stuff that he needs, They have to get the house certified as safe for a hurricane. It's part of their regulations because, as you know, that's one of the hot spots for hurricanes. So in the Bahamas, when there is a hurricane and everyone else is busy watching CNN and Sky News and tracking and following the path and saying it's coming, it would make landfall and it's a category this, that and the other. Bahamians are not with all of that stuff. They're watching sitcoms. They're chilling out. They're drinking tea, they're they're just enjoying their lives because they know that the house they live in is safe and secure because they know they would not have moved into that house without the certificate Mm -hmm. of safety. In the same way, you were created to withstand anything that life throws at you and your mind 
and your body are certified as safe. I love a statement my son made, Aaron. He made this years ago when he was young and he said, Mommy, I don't think God would have placed us on earth if it wasn't suitable for our survival. And that's so comforting, just as it was turning a twin to a teen when he said that. And it, it's so true. So you were created to withstand the storm, even though it's unpleasant, even though it's noisy all around you, you were created to handle it. I believe when a storm comes to clear your path, it takes with it any expired projects or um, wrong mindsets, rotten beliefs, or even people that don't belong in your life. So where are you headed? Are the tools you're carrying now necessary to get you where you're going? Because anything you don't need, the hurricane can take away and will take away. But you see, we tend to hold on. Fear will stop you from letting go. If your identity is tied to tangible things like your job, material wealth, or your societal status, like I said in the previous episode, you will have a hard time recovering because as far as you can see, your life has just been ripped apart by a storm. So detach yourself from anything that is temporal and start to remove the layers that you have called your identity. Finally, you need a mindset of discomfort, one that's comfortable with discomfort. In the UK, we don't have storms, we have gale force winds, and we make a big fuss about it. So in January this year, we had Storm Brendan come, and overnight, he finally arrived and wrecked his mini <laughs> devastation. But it was quite bad because we woke up to find our neighbor's fence in our garden, and our garden and the neighbor's garden looked like one massive garden. There were no barriers, there were no borders. Sometimes the storm comes to remove the fences that keep you from dreaming big so that you can dream without limits because fences keep us in our comfort zone and I don't know why we dream so carefully and gently as though we're scared to burst the bubble or we're scared to outdream God. We can't outdream God. But women in particular seem to be really skilled at playing small. And playing small does not mean that you're in a small environment or you're in a safe place. It just means that you are guaranteed to end up with small results because your thinking is limited. If your comfort has been expanded, if you like, or snatched away by the storm like our fence, then it's time for you to expand to the left and to the right and don't hold back. One thing you don't want to do is use your energy and resources and your time to re-erect a fence that will keep you plain small. You definitely cannot outdream God. He has a big dream for you. One tip you'll find me recommending over and over is journaling. I believe every woman should journal. It separates facts from assumptions and your journal can be your own therapist. My recommendation for you this week is to rewrite your story in its rock star version. If you're yet to subscribe, please do so. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, head over to iTunes and give it a five-star rating. Also, don't forget to share it with your friends. If you're still on the fence about subscribing, I invite you to come back next week because I'll be sharing a life-changing principle that I adopted five years ago and I now live my life and run my business by it. To connect with me, please go to talksarotere.com, which is my first name and surname.com, where you can join my mailing list and be notified of new blog posts. I'm also on social at Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn as at Talks Arotere, first name, last name, no dashes or underscores. Thank you for listening and remember to live always from the inside out. Mm-hmm.